Good afternoon. I'm General David Berger, Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I'm joined today by Lieutenant General Steve Rudder, the Commander of U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific. Lieutenant General Jody Osterman, the Commanding General of First Marine Expeditionary Force. Lieutenant General Carson Heckler, who will soon take command of one MEF and Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Black. Yesterday evening, an amphibious assault vehicle or AAD with the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit suffered a mishap off the coast of Southern California where the vehicle sank after taking on water. First, I'd like to thank everyone for their heartfelt condolences on behalf of our Marines, sailors, and family members affected by this tragic mishap. Let me add my own condolences and prayers to theirs and ask everyone to keep the families of these service members in their thoughts. There were 15 Marines and one sailor aboard the AAV at the time of the mishap. And as of this afternoon, we found eight Marines. One Marine has died as a result of his injuries. Two Marines remain in critical condition and are in the care of civilian medical professionals at Scripps Memorial Hospital. Five of the eight Marines rescued are back aboard the assigned ship. We still have seven Marines and one sailor who remain missing, and search and rescue efforts are ongoing to find them. This mishap is under investigation. We will share the results of it once it is complete and the family has been notified. In the meantime, I've directed an immediate suspension of amphibious assault vehicle water operations until the causal factors of this mishap are better understood. All AAVs across the fleet will be inspected. Again, I'd like to offer our most heartful, heartfelt thoughts and prayers to the families of our Marines and sailors. And I'll turn it over now to Lieutenant General Osterman, the Commanding General of First Marine Expeditionary Force. Well, good afternoon. As the uh, Commandant mentioned, I'm uh, Lieutenant General Jody Osterman, the Commanding General of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that our thoughts and prayers are with the families affected uh, by these Marines that have been in the mishap. Very tragic situation that is part of our family here at One Met. Uh, the incident occurred uh, just off of San Clemente Island, and uh, it was part of our amphibious training that uh, we do with the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, of which these uh, Marines and sailors were uh, a part of. The, uh, the operations there, as I said, were part of normal uh, waterborne training. Uh, when the AAV began to take on water, they signaled to the rest of the uh, unit that they were, in fact, taking on water. The immediate response was provided by two additional Amtraks that were with them to aid two more amphibious assault vehicles as well as the safety boat, which is uh, always accompanying our water operations. And as the Commandant mentioned, we were able to uh, rescue eight of the Marines uh, there, and we are still uh, continuing search operations in the uh, uh, SAR operations, if you will, for the uh, other seven Marines and so on that we have not yet met. So again, uh, our heartfelt uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the family members with that, I'll be ready to take any questions that you might have. Why don't you start, Julie? Oh, sure. I wanted to know if um, they, if you, they've actually inspected the AAV or uh, and are divers being sent in? Can you talk a little bit more and, and sure. how long the rescue will go versus recovery? Yeah, the uh, basically the AAV uh, in that part of off of the islands there for anybody that's familiar with them, the uh, water drops off very quickly. So uh, the AAV is actually in several hundred feet of water. It's uh, really below the depth that a diver can go to. And uh, so we're working, and I really owe an incredible uh, uh, gratitude and thanks to our Navy and our Coast Guard uh, brethren who helped us in this endeavor. Uh, they're actually working with us to provide uh, assets that can uh, basically get down to take a look at the AAV. And then um, we are, Continuing search and rescue operations at this point. Uh, we have not been able to recover the operations. We're still looking for uh, the uh, seven, uh, seven Marines and one sailor who uh, we have not yet found. So, anyway, that's basically uh, the, the parameters associated with it. And 
And just as a follow-up, sorry, real quick, the assets, are you talking about um, maybe a remote control, something that can go down to check on? Uh, you know, I don't have the specifics. We, we told them, obviously, that we would like to be able to uh, see what's happening and then assess the situation. So um, they, they have a lot of technical knowledge in that realm and are going to basically figure out what the best asset is to uh, um, as the, as General Osterman, so how soon after the AV came off of the Somerset did it start taking on water? Was it immediately after coming off or, and, or was it, you know, moving along and then went down and began taking in water? Do you have any idea on that? Well, they were basically completing training. They had already come ashore the, the day prior and had been conducting uh, training operations ashore as well as a well. So they were actually on their way from the island back out to the oh, okay. ship. And uh, I don't know the exact distances, but uh, uh, over a thousand meters offshore, it was a quite a distance before, you know, it was noticed that they were in the water. Channel Hike, um, you've mentioned the, the, the training, or the, the training kind of stand down and inspection requirement. Can you talk a little bit about what, what prompted you to do that at this point on this first day and what's kind of involved in both of those aspects? Thank you. Out of precaution before we understand what caused this, um, I'm pausing, we are pausing the waterborne operation for Amtrak. Once we determine what the cause was, then we'll make a second decision whether we continue. But this is to ensure out of an abundance of caution that we take uh, the time, give the time to the uh, recovery and find out what actually happened. So Amtrak units can continue to train ashore. We'll just wait until we have a better picture of what caused this. dovetails off of that. This is the third time that an AAV has taken on water and sunk in the last decade. Do, do we see any similarities, at least from the last two, 2017 and 2011? we we'll wait till this investigation is, is done. I think all of you want the same thing. First, to make sure the families are taken care of and that the search and rescue efforts go with all the support that we wanted to. And then, we'll, then after the investigation is done, we'll see, as always, if there are any trends, if there's any linkages. Uh, first step, conduct the search and rescue and take care of the families. Thank you. That's what the focus is today. So if, I, if I could, uh, also just to clarify, it's, it's actually the last 25 years, and uh, we maintain an inventory of over 800 uh, vehicles, uh, eight FMS assault vehicles. So just to put in context uh, the two vehicles, um, sure, uh, for those who didn't hear the question, this it was pertaining to the difficulty to egress the uh, amphibious assault vehicles. The amphibious assault vehicles are built and uh, spe the specifications are they can hold 21 personnel in the back with up to 285 pounds of gear each and then they have three crew members as well. This particular AAV had a total of 16 personnel on board so it wasn't anywhere near the maximum number and from an egress perspective just an awful lot of uh, dynamics involved with that. Uh, with the personnel recovered obviously some were able to egress but as the comment I mentioned, until the investigation was completed, we won't know all the details of, you know, of, of that, that part of it. Each AAV does have three watertight hatches forward for the crew, and then it has two very large troop hatches in the back that uh, come up and open. Uh, the vehicle itself weighs 26 tons, so with that, uh, you know, and the, the water and the freeboard, uh, you know, it, it has a, a, a natural buoyancy to it obviously to be able to conduct operations but again depending on how much water wave height things like that it, you know it's kind of a relative uh, decision about that how much water or anything like that. Can you talk a little about uh, you, you mentioned the wave can you talk a little bit about what the was carrying how much of wave and whether they had any sort of plantation device? Sure um, the marines were in their normal combat gear so uh, they're uh, 
their body armor, the basic uh, kit that they have with them. With them. Like I said, they had been ashore the day before as part of the operation. The, uh, they all had flotation as well. That's part of our uh, equipment loadout that goes with it. It's an inflatable vest that they they wear with that. Uh, with the rescue operations, some of those Marines were picked up because they were floating. Uh, so it's just you know that's about all the detail I have on the individuals. So uh, the gear you know for those Marines. Can you please clarify on the 1,000 meters control? Is from the beach or from the island? Uh, it would be it was more it was more than a thousand meters, less than two thousand meters from the beach on the island, uh, on the north uh, west corner of the island. And also, uh, the condition of the two injured are they still in the hospital or how are they doing? Uh, right now, I, I don't want to talk about specific medical conditions because of you know, their privacy and HIPAA rules. But right now, they uh, they are both stable. Uh, and they've, uh, my understanding is that they've moved out of the uh, intensive unit to the, uh, uh, the standard ICU unit, so they've been stable enough to reach out. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, can you talk about the condition of the you know, I don't have the specifics of the conditions. I do know that, uh, and something I had asked the commander about the uh, the assessments. There's always a surf assessment or a wave action assessment that's done to make sure it's within the parameters uh, for the AAVs to execute, just like boats or anything else. And uh, it was within the parameters that we had. Uh, I just don't. There's everything from wave height to chop to uh, you know a number of different factors. That Can you uh, talk about what assets you have currently right now assisting the search and recovery uh, surface as well as airborne and if other agencies like the Coast Guard is involved? And also what support is being provided to both the crew aboard and the families, things like chaplains and other support they can provide? Um, right now uh, on station, uh, We've got the uh, USS Essex, a large deck uh, amphibious ship, uh, the Somerset from San Diego, which are all associated uh, with uh, the training that was going on. Uh, also a destroyer uh, that was uh, on station as well. She she came over from a distant location uh, very quickly at, uh, with high speed to, to get there in time. And then there's, um, those are the surface vessels. Coast Guard Cutter was also involved. And uh, yesterday and today, we've had uh, helicopters up 24 hours a day, um, mostly associated with the search and rescue helicopters with sensors, Coast Guard helicopters as well as Navy helicopters, and Marine Corps helicopters. And then, uh, uh, from a, kind of a surface perspective, the, the ARGMU has 11-meter uh, inflatable, uh, original inflatable boats. Summer Fury. Summer Fury. Uh, there, 
My understanding is there were a total of 13 Amtrak's. 13. 13. Time for one more question. Um, can you tell me um, how old the AAV is, if we know, and how long it took to go down? Did they record the time? Um, the the age of the AAV, I don't know for that particular one. AAVs were originally procured in 1972, but they've gone through many what we call service life extension programs. So up at Barstow, they bring it in, they literally take it down to just the hull and uh, rebuild everything inside of it. And uh, with the age of that vehicle fleet, we've done that multiple times through the years to keep them uh, safe. Uh, some of the recent modifications include things like emergency lighting and those kinds of things that are included in there, you know, that pertain to the address. And then how long did they time? How long it took to go down? Uh, you know, I don't know exactly. I do know that uh, it, it was a very short time for the rescue uh, to commence on that spot because they were very close to the adjacent uh, AAVs, but I don't have the investigation to bear out some of those details about the timing. Okay, one last question. Thank you. 